Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and you are watching my second video on Petrarch which I have subtitled Masculine Desire. So this goes along with my other Petrarch video as well as the video presentation called Myth and Renaissance Lyric. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is essentially uh, running through the argument presented by Nancy Vickers in her article Diana Described Scattered Woman and Scattered Rhyme, which was originally published uh, in Critical Inquiry back in 1981. And what she's doing is discussing Petrarch's influence from a feminist literary criti critical uh, perspective. So this is going to be basically just breaking down her argument, going through it um, chronologically. Uh, so if you have the article, you can follow along with it. Um, otherwise, take notes as you see fit. So her thesis is that Petrarch's description of Laura in his scattered rhymes, in his ream sparse, uh, becomes the central model for the depiction of female beauty in the West. It becomes the, the model for what an idealized perfect woman is and the way to talk about female beauty. And this is a model, she argues, that's internalized by both men and women. It's something that both men and women generally accept as the dominant idea of what a perfect woman is and how one appreciates beauty. Now, in order to understand her argument, it's important to understand the theoretical basis. The ideas that Vickers is assuming, but that don't, uh, that, that underline her argument, but that she does not explicitly state. And one of those is her understanding of the relationship of literature to history. How do we use literature to understand historical facts or historical reality? Well, in her view, um, Literature is not simply a handmaiden to history. That is, literature isn't just a simple reproduction of historical fact. So we can't just look at literature as a record, a transparent record of what people thought. Um, rather, she understands uh, implicitly art to be taking part in the historical process. That is, literature is just as much a creator of history and something that shapes culture rather than just a reflection or reporting of it. So that's the basis of the idea that what Petrarch is saying is not just a reflection of what people thought, but rather goes into shaping the very real relationships that people have in terms of the way they think about beauty. She's also making, uh, building her argument on some presumptions about the subject or the individual, the self. Um, so she's, her understanding of subjectivity is based in the idea that subjectivity is a complex and socially influenced phenomenon that who you are as an individual, as a person, is not just some natural innate born quality, but rather it's the product of multiple forces and multiple discourses, that is multiple ideas and, and vocabularies. Um, also, the subject is incomplete, that we are at our basis incomplete and driven by loss, driven by the desire to fulfill that incompleteness. And finally, she is uh, taking part in the idea, or taking part in the, the project that Stephen Greenblatt describes as self-fashioning. That is the idea that in the Renaissance and today, there was a particular awareness of the fact that the self could be fashioned, that the individual subject, again, is a product of multiple discourses and multiple phenomena, not just something that's natural and inborn to the individual. A third sort of theoretical basis to her argument is her understanding of patriarchy, which is that patriarchy, again, is a complex system. It's not just something that inheres in one person, but it's a systemic uh, phenomenon. And it's made up of social, political, and economic relations between men that are hierarchically organized. And that patriarchy as a system is reproduced through both material practices, that is the, the physical practices and the economic practices that keep, and political practices that keep women oppressed uh, and under the thumb of male authority, but also through discursive practices, that is through poetry, through ideology. And so, in other words, she's looking at 
how what Petrarch writes takes part in the patriarchal project. So we might, if we wanted to say, what are the, the theoretical lenses that she's employing? Well, I would say the three most important um, areas that she's drawing on are first new historicism. That is the model, as I said, that sees literature as part of the historic process, not just a reflection of it. Um, and in that, she's following, you know, one of the most influential names, Stephen Greenblatt, in his, who wrote uh, the famous book, Self-Fashioning, as well as the work of the French philosopher Michel Foucault, whose work was very influential for new historicists. Um, she's also drawing on psychoanalytic theories of the subject, um, and we can particularly point to Sigmund Freud and the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. And she's also drawing on a very wide body of feminist theory. And really, there's a the whole a huge number of different feminist theorists that she's drawing on, including other psychoanalytic uh, feminist theorists. But a couple that I think are particularly important are Laura Mulvey, who uh, she cites, Vickers cites in her article, as talking about the power of the male gaze, the power of the authority of the male uh, uh, eye as it looks at the female body. And a uh, feminist critic, Gail Rubin, who talks about the different material and discursive processes that go into constructing patriarchy. So these are the sort of basis, uh, bases that I think really form the, the theoretical underpinning of Vicker's argument. And these are some of the places that you might look if you wanted to start understanding not just her argument, but how she thinks about the subjects in order to come to the, the point of making this argument in the first place. So now let's look at what she's saying again, back to her argument about Petrarch and what he's doing in his description of Laura. So she notes after her uh, opening where she announces her claim that, that this model becomes um, the dominant model of female beauty, that we never see Laura in as a whole person. We never see a full picture of Laura. Rather, it's a fragmentary portrait. It's a series of body parts, um, which again, as my other uh, lecture talks about the various parts that are described and how she's objectified as a series of disparate and disconnected items that, while beautiful and valuable, are still um, inanimate objects. And she notes that this anatomizing description, this was a hallmark of Petrarch's style. And she gives an example of a poem by Joachim du Bellay, a French poet who himself had once been Petrarchan in style, mocking the tendency of Petrarchan poetry to uh, anatomize the woman. So this is the picture of Laura that we get, just a series of body parts, of fetishes, of objects. And she notes the mythic origins of this procedure, this process of anatomizing the woman, Vickers identifies those in the Acteon Diana story, which is uh, Petrarch retells in his sonnet 23. She sees this story as central to the poetic psychology of the poems, that is central to what Petrarch is doing psychologically um, in terms of the, the interaction between lover and loved object. And this story, as she notes, is about seeing women, seeing women, seeing women that are particularly forbidden to be seen. Um, so it serves as an appropriate allegory, appropriate model for Petrarch's state of seeing this unattainable, beautiful woman, Laura. And she notes, the uh, Vickers notes the frequent association in Ovid, which is the source of the Acta and Diana story, frequent association of seeing and dismemberment. In addition to Acteon, there's characters, uh, there's stories about Pentheus and Orpheus, and the common theme amongst these stories is that the sight of a forbidden woman leads to bodily destruction, bodily dismemberment. So the female body is a threat to the integrity of the male self. So this is the mythic origin that underlies this fragmented portrait of Laura. So what does Petrarch's Acteon do? What is notable about Petrarch's Acteon? Because Petrarch isn't just retelling Ovid's story, he's transforming it, obviously. So what's notable is that Petrarch's Acteon is self-aware. 
In fact, he's the one speaking this story, whereas in Ovid's version, Acteon cannot speak. So he's very self-aware. He knows that his fate will be, as Vickers puts it, annihilation through dismemberment. He's awaiting that. So he's caught in this middle state between the joy, the pleasure of seeing Diana, the, the beautiful goddess of chastity, this forbidden sight. He's caught between the joy of that and wanting to express that joy and the pain of never being able to fulfill his desire for that body, that he's never going to have her, and the dismemberment that's approaching, which is uh, a sort of uh, sim symbolizes the, the, unfulfill the unfulfillable, unattainable desire. So he's in this middle position, this middle state. And the effect of this, as Vickers says, is a productive paralysis. His poetry that comes out of this middle state is an expression of this mix of joy and pain. And this is the classic, um, we see this throughout Petrarch and we see this throughout all of the poets that take him as his model, including Shakespeare. Um, it becomes the standard pose of the lovesick poet to experience both joy and pain and to sort of revel in the joy that brings pain and the pain that brings joy. So it, it also mythologizes the loved object. By using this story as the basis, it raises Laura to the status of goddess and thus raises the status of Petrarch's whole project. So a productive paralysis, rather than being silenced, Petrarch's Acteon is prompted to speak and to continue to speaking endlessly about his joy and his pain. Back to the myth, Vickers notes that the central move in the myth, it's identification and reversal, that's the dynamic. Acteon and Diana are both hunters, and we have this confrontation. Acteon, in a sense, identifies with Diana, but then he, his identity is reversed. He becomes the hunted in, uh, uh, in this confrontation. So that's the kind of dynamic that's at work. And as Vickers will point out, Petrarch appropriates that dynamic of identification and reversal for his Acteon's uh, poetic expression. Now, why does the myth have this power? What is the, where does this myth come from, um, this myth of forbidden femininity? Well, uh, there are some, and many anthropologists and mythologists uh, uh, write that there are certain psychoanalytic roots, that this is an allegory for the primal encounter with difference, the first sight of the female body that the male child has and sees that that body is different. It does not have all the same organs as his body, which raises in psychoanalytic discourse, the idea of the possibility of dismemberment. So the sight of the female body makes the male fear that he could perhaps be similarly dismembered or in psychoanal uh, psychoanalytic terms, castrated. Um, another take is that this myth is a kind of, uh, goes back to the ancient prohibition on incest. That's an allegory of the encounter with the forbidden body, the female body that you cannot possess, the one that is under the possession of the uh, ultimate male authority. So that's where uh, one, some theories at least, of where this power of the myth comes from, the power uh, uh, and, and the sort of energy that's generated by this myth of Acteon being dismembered at the sight of Diana's un unattainable forbidden body. So how does Acteon respond, that is Petrarch's Acteon? In the myth, in the original Ovidian myth, Petrarch, or excuse me, Acteon uh, can only flee and be dismembered, but Petrarch's Acteon changes things. He neutralizes the threat of imminent dismemberment, as Vickers puts it, through his own descriptive dismemberment. He turns the woman's body into images and into words. It's a sort of double dismemberment of her by scattering her body throughout his narrative. So it's the identification and reversal where Acteon had become the hunted is now reversed again and Diana becomes the dismembered body rather than him, 
or in the larger frame of the whole poetic corpus, uh, the whole poetic sequence, Laura's body is dismembered rather than Petrarch's. And Vickers points to the title of this, po uh, this group of poems, the Rime Sparse, or Scattered Rhymes. So that word sparse, which has its root in the Italian word spargere, or to scatter, and that this word to scatter is used throughout the poem, uh, throughout the poems repeatedly, Vickers notices. So she says, this is a theme, this is a motif that we see throughout the text, the idea of scattering her beauty in the descriptions, in the rhymes, throughout the poems. And this is, again, a response to, a compensation for the threat of loss at the vision of the unattainable female body. So we see that there's an economy of desire here. That is, desire is circulating and changing shape, transforming throughout this poem. The female body, the desired female body, is replaced by poetic expression. So the unfulfilled desire that Acteon cannot, uh, that he can't act on, excuse the pun, um, is sublimated into a desire for poetry, into his speech. And so he reenacts that violation, threat, and neutralization over and over again for his implicitly male readers. In this process of the female body being replaced by the poetic text, the female body becomes, the poetic text becomes a fetish for the body. So what is a fetish? In psychoanalytic discourse, a fetish is an object that replaces some absent, unattainable object of desire. And so the fetish takes on the desire in place of the object whose absence it represents. So the woman is not there, Diana is not there, Laura is not there. So the images of her body, the various body parts, and the descriptions of them become the fetish. They become the object of desire itself that replaces what cannot be had. And there's a great irony here in, as Vickers had said, this productive par paralysis that's provoked through the sight of the unattainable female body ends up producing desire in its attempt to fulfill desire. That is, Petrarch cannot have, or Acteon cannot have, the body of Diana, and so that, that desire is sublimated into poetry, but the poetry is just the repetition and reinscription of the loss that inspires it in the first place. That is, all he can write poetry about is the loss that inspires him to write poetry. And so the desire that he is, uh, that he has becomes not so much the desire for Laura, but the desire for others desire. That is, his desire is directed towards the male, again, implicitly male readers who will read his poetry and thus reinscribe his self, reproduce him again and again through reading of the poetry. So the failure to achieve fulfillment becomes the subject of, po of poetry and becomes the fulfillment itself. And as Vickers says, the text ultimately is structured by a series of oppositions between fulfillment and desire, presence and loss. It becomes a kind of perpetual motion machine, a desiring machine, where failure becomes success. The inability to achieve one's desire becomes the goal itself. The expression of that inability is the goal, is the object of the poem, rather than the unattainable female object, which of course itself would never fulfill one's desire. And Petrarch plays on this with his pun on Laura and Lauro, the laurel wreath, the traditional crown of poets, which becomes what he longs for and what he receives instead of Laura. So the one is replaced by the other. And is this laurel wreath, is it satisfactory? Can it ever really fulfill his desire? Can anything fulfill one's desire, we might ask? And the dismembered Acteon becomes the speaking eye of the poet, becomes remembered, reconstructed 
as the poetic voice. And Vickers concludes by taking us back again to the her thesis and the ultimate importance of Petrarch. What is he doing here? This isn't just a poetic model, even though it does become the standard pose for many lovesick poets and the standard pose that Shakespeare himself uses and mocks in much of his work. But it, again, goes beyond just this literary world. What Petrarch is doing is normalizing a violent and fetishizing sexuality. It's loving, he loves Laura, but it is still a form of violent dismemberment. And the masculine voice becomes articulated, finds itself, finds its authority to speak through the dismemberment of the woman. And the man finds fulfillment through the through this dismemberment or some semblance of fulfillment. And implicitly, the woman is silenced. The male voice articulates itself on the woman's silence. And we note that Petrarch, in his modification of the story, silences Diana. In Ovid's version, Diana had some words that she had cursed Acteon with, but in Petrarch's version, Diana is silenced while Acteon speaks. So it normalizes, again, a, a violent model of sexuality that becomes the literary and the social and the cultural model for the idealized female beauty and the appropriate male uh, approach and attitude to female beauty, which is to fetishize it, to objectify it, and to possess it through a kind of violent dismemberment. So that's the end of this video uh, presentation. If you have any questions, please contact me. You know how. Otherwise, have a great day, a great evening, great morning, great afternoon, and I will see you on the next video.